from age immemorial, societies have relied on the moral force of women. While certainly not the only positive influence at work in society, the moral foundation provided by women has proved uniquely beneficial to the common good. Perhaps because it is pervasive, this contribution of women is often underappreciated. I wish to express gratitude for the influence of good women, identify some of the philosophies and trends that threaten women's strength and standing, and voice a plea to women to cultivate the innate moral power within them. Women bring with them into the world a certain virtue, a divine gift that makes them adept and instilling such qualities as faith, courage, empathy, and refinement in relationships and in cultures. When praising the unfeigned faith he found in Timothy, Paul noted that this faith dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. Years ago, while living in Mexico, I observed firsthand what Paul meant. I recall a particular young mother, one of many among the women of the Church in Mexico, whose faith in God graces their lives so naturally they seem scarcely aware of it. This lovely woman radiated a moral authority, born of goodness, that influenced all around her for good. With her husband, she sacrificed a number of pleasures and possessions for their higher priorities seemingly without a second thought. Her ability to perform feats of lifting, bending, and balancing with her children was near superhuman. The demands on her were many, and her tasks often repetitive and mundane. Yet underneath it all was a beautiful serenity, a sense of being about God's work. As with the Savior, blessing others by service and sacrifice had ennobled her. She was love personified. I have been remarkably blessed by the moral influence of women, in particular my mother and my wife. A woman's moral influence is no more or nowhere more powerfully felt or more beneficially employed than in the home. There is no better setting for rearing the rising generation than the traditional family where a father and a mother work in harmony to provide for, teach, and nurture their children. Where this ideal does not exist, people strive to duplicate its benefits as best they can in their particular circumstances. In all events, a mother can exert an influence unequaled by any other person in any other relationship. By the power of her example and teaching her sons learn to respect womanhood and to incorporate discipline and high moral standards in their own lives. Her daughters learn to cultivate their own virtue and to stand up for what is right again and again, however unpopular. A mother's love and high expectations lead her children to act responsibly, without excuses, to be serious about education and personal development, and to make ongoing contributions to the well-being of all around them. Elder Neil A. Maxwell once asked, When the real history of mankind is fully disclosed, will it feature the echoes of gunfire or the shaping sound of lullabies, the great armistices made by military men, or the peacemaking of women in homes and in neighborhoods? Will what happened in cradles and kitchens prove to be more controlling than what happened in Congresses? Most sacred is a woman's role in the creation of life. We know that our physical bodies have a divine origin and that we must experience both a physical birth and a spiritual rebirth to reach the highest realms in God's celestial kingdom. Thus, women play an integral part, sometimes at the risk of their own lives, in God's work and glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. As grandmothers, mothers, and role models, women have been the guardians of the wellspring of life, teaching each generation the importance of sexual purity, of chastity before marriage, and fidelity within marriage. 
In this way, they've been a civilizing influence in society. They have brought out the best in men. They perpetuated wholesome environments in which to raise secure and healthy children. Sisters, I don't want to overpraise you as we do sometimes in Mother's Day talks that make you cringe. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect. I don't claim that you are, with one possible exception who's sitting nearby at the moment. <clears throat> What I mean to say is that wherever, or whether you're single or married, whether you have born children or not, whether you're old, young, or in between, your moral authority is vital. And that perhaps we've begun to take it and you for granted. Certainly there are trends and forces at work that would weaken, even eliminate your influence to the great detriment of individuals, families, and society at large. Let me mention three as a caution and a warning. A pernicious philosophy that undermines women's moral influence is the devaluation of marriage and of motherhood and homemaking as a career. Some feminist thinkers view homemaking with outright contempt, arguing it demeans women and that the relentless demands of raising children are a form of exploitation. They ridicule what they call the mommy track as a career. This is not fair or right. We do not diminish the value of what women or men achieve in any worthy endeavor or career. We all benefit from those achievements. But we still recognize there is not a higher good than motherhood and fatherhood and marriage. There is no superior career, and no amount of money, authority, or public acclaim can exceed the ultimate rewards of family. Whatever else a woman may accomplish, her moral influence is no more optimally employed than here. Attitudes toward human sexuality threaten the moral authority of women on several fronts. Abortion, for personal or social convenience, strikes at the heart of a woman's most sacred powers and destroys her moral authority. The same is true of sexual immorality and of revealing dress that not only debases women, but reinforces the lie that a woman's sexuality is what defines her worth. There's long been a cultural double standard that expected women to be sexually circumspect while excusing male immorality. The unfairness of such a double standard is obvious, and it has been justifiably criticized and rejected. In that rejection, one would have hoped that men would rise to the higher single standard but just the opposite has occurred. Women and girls are now encouraged to be as promiscuous as the double standard expected men to be. Where once women's higher standards demanded commitment and responsibility from men, we now have sexual relations without conscience, fatherless families, and growing poverty. Equal opportunity promiscuity simply robs women of their moral influence and degrades all of society. In this hollow bargain, it is men who are liberated and women and children who suffer most. A third area of concern comes from those who, in the name of equality, want to erase all differences between the masculine and the feminine. Often this takes the form of pushing women to adopt more masculine traits, be more aggressive, tough, and confrontational. It's now common in movies and video games to see women in terribly violent roles leaving dead bodies and mayhem in their wake. It's soul-numbing to see men in such roles, and certainly no less so when women are the ones perpetrating and suffering the violence. Former Young Women General President Margaret D. Nadal taught, The world has enough women who are tough. We need women who are tender. There are enough women who are coarse. We need women who are kind. There are enough women who are rude. We need women who are refined. We have enough women of fame and fortune. We need more women of faith. <clears throat> we have enough greed. We need more goodness. We have enough vanity. We need more virtue. We have enough popularity. We need more purity." Unquote. In blurring the feminine and masculine differences, we lose the distinct complementary gifts women and men that together produce a greater whole. 
My plea to women and girls today is to protect and cultivate the moral force that is within you. Preserve that innate virtue and unique gifts you bring with you into the world. Your intuition is to do good and to be good. And as you follow the Holy Spirit, your moral authority will inf and influence will grow. To the young women, I say, don't lose that moral force even before you have it in full measure. Take particular care that your language is clean, not coarse, that your dress reflects modesty, not vanity, and that your conduct manifests purity, not promiscuity. You cannot lift others to virtue on the one hand if you are entertaining vice on the other. Sisters of all your associations, it is your relationship with God, your Heavenly Father, who is the source of your moral power that you must always put first in your life. Remember that Jesus' power came through His single-minded devotion to the will of the Father. He never varied from that which pleased His Father. Strive to be that kind of disciple of the Father and the Son, and your influence will never fade. And do not be afraid to apply that influence without fear or apology. Be ready always to give an answer to every man, woman, and child that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Bring up your children in light and truth. Teach them to pray and to walk uprightly before the Lord. In these exhortations to women, let no one willfully misunderstand. By praising and encouraging the moral force in women, I am not saying that men and boys are somehow excused from their own duty to stand for truth and righteousness, that their responsibility to serve, and sacrifice, and minister is somehow less than that of women or can be left to women. Brethren, let us stand with women, share their burdens, and cultivate our own companion moral authority. Dear sisters, we rely on the moral force you bring to the world, to marriage, to family, to the Church. We rely on blessings you bring down from heaven by your prayers and faith. We pray for your security, welfare, and happiness, and for your influence to be sustained. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.